Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the last session of our seminar series in this term. It's a pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Professor uh, Atocha Liceda Yera. She's a full professor at the Institute for Philosophical Research at UNAM and one of the main researchers in the intersection of logic and philosophy of science. Her research topics include adoptive reasoning and the logics of scientific discovery. In particular, topics related to causality and clinical reasoning, all of them of interest for our group here in Milan. Even though uh, Professor Aliceda is getting away from logic and moving, moving to methodological issues in the philosophy of science, logical analysis still occupies her thoughts. And today she will present to us a model for medical reasoning and some challenges thereof. So uh, thanks, Professor, for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. That's uh, great, Alejandro. Uh, thank you. I am. Uh, it's it's an honor for me to 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 be here. Uh, first of all, uh, although it's virtual, I, I had an invitation before the pandemic. I think even a year ago to be in Milano, and I didn't use it. So this is what happens to me now it's only virtual but I very much hope that I plan to be in Europe by the end of next year so hopefully I will be able to go uh, to uh, Milan and say hello to all of you uh, there but uh, since we are now in a virtual world I suppose there is uh, some people in the audience from Mexico and also from other parts of the world so I uh, thank you all for uh, being here as Alejandro said, uh, I am actually trying, and it's almost impossible, but trying to get away from logic. No, uh, only because I am uh, more interested now in uh, more general issues, but still methodological issues in philosophy of science. And I'm uh, uh, moving to, in particular, to philosophy of medicine. Uh, however, I uh, uh, did the work that I'm going to present to you some years ago, uh, with a student, uh, a, a master's student, uh, Laura Leonides, with whom uh, we ended up writing a, uh, a article uh, uh, titled Hypothesis Testing in Adaptive Logics, an Application to Medical Diagnosis. The problem here is that uh, it involves, this issue involves issues in philosophy of science, in particular the uh, the question of how hypotheses may be tested and the application is in medical diagnosis. I will show you a, a particular case or uh, better say an extract of a particular case, a neurological case. But more importantly, in this context, I will use adaptive logics. Uh, I'm not married or, or anything like that with a particular logic or, or, or logical system. But I chose this one, uh, first of all, because of my student, uh, she, she went to Belgium where adaptive logics uh, were invented and she liked the, them very much. But uh, more in particular, uh, for two reasons. First of all, I think that if logicians want to apply their models, their logical models into the, so to speak, real world, and more in particular to uh, issues having to do with change, we need some kind of dynamic logics. By dynamic logics, I mean any logic that can deal with change. And that's, uh, that's difficult, but not impossible. And uh, abduction really um, almost uh, obliges you to, to think about change because an abduction is a, a generation of an explanation. And it, it uh, many times involves change, changes in the theory. So this is not just a logical challenge, as I wrote in the uh, title of the talk, which is a role of hypothesis. I didn't put testing, but it's in general hypothesis in medical diagnosis, a logical challenge. Uh, moreover, I think it's important for logicians to know, at least I learned this, uh, uh, especially... especially clinical sessions done by uh, medical doctors, that even if we concentrate on a logical analysis of, or better say, say uh, an investigation on what are the logical, uh, logical kinds or uh, reasoning types that medical doctors use, even if we concentrate on that, we cannot say it's just abduction or it's just deduction. 
they use an allergy, they use many other things. So if we want to model uh, formally the way they reason, we really need a logic that can deal with changes, but also a logical language in which we can distinguish the, so to speak, status, uh, evidence status of our formula. Some of them may be premises, some of them may be hypotheses, and some of them may be uh, the product of applying logical uh, rules. So this is, uh, uh, sounds very easy, but once you uh, want to implement these things in logic, things get very complicated. So now let me uh, move to my uh, presentation. So I will be sharing my uh, screen. All right, yeah, there is me, sorry, <laughs> in, in, in San Diego, by the way. Uh, so this is, let me put this here. Okay, so just one uh, clarification. Uh, I'm actually seeing uh, the presenters here, but if there's any problem or, or any question, it's going to be difficult for me to spot uh, who wants to speak or anything like that. So just uh, uh, tell me if somebody wants to, uh, to interrupt me. So this is the paper that I wrote with uh, Laura Le Leonides. Uh, this is just to uh, show it to you. But I will move to my uh, presentation here. I was just, okay. Uh, this is a, a longer title. So as I started already, uh, my motivation really, uh, general, general question is how do physicians reason when they build a diagnostic hypothesis? And I wrote a paper many years ago. It's important only to tell you that uh, this was the result of attending clinical sessions. I was there with my co-authors, uh, Ana Cecilia Rodriguez de Romo. She is a historian of science. She was working in the history of diagnosis and uh, Alberto Arauz, a neurologist. So we basically reconstructed a case and I'm going to show you a extract of that case. So this is basically the, uh, the context. And for uh, people interested in epistemology, this is a kind of technology of medical reasoning because I was, so to speak, inspired by what I saw in the clinical sessions. As I already said, one of the things was precisely that they use several uh, uh, reasoning types. Okay, so uh, this is uh, already a, a simplification, but when we think of uh, the process of uh, building a diagnostic hypothesis, uh, medical doctors go from symptoms and signs plus physical examination and test results, uh, usually from uh, laboratory to a diagnostic hypothesis. But this uh, arrow uh, actually goes back and forth because sometimes what they want to do, and I will focus on that in particular, they want to test the hypothesis. How do a physician test his or her hypothesis uh, given symptoms and signs and so on. So uh, that's why this arrow is not in one uh, direction. Let me just very, very briefly uh, tell you some of the challenges of building a diagnose. Diagnoses are uncertain. I will explain why. They are constructed with incomplete and dynamic information. Medical doctors have to uh, build up a diagnosis uh, most of the time with incomplete information. And also this information changes. This information changes because we gain more information about the pa patient once he or he, she is on the treatment. And also because uh, the, the way a uh, particular ir illness evolve, that's another kind of a change. Sorry. Oh, professor, can you put your full screen? It's because... Of course, let Thank me, okay. Let me see how that's done. Is this full? This mm, is not. Yeah. The thing is that this is a, a PDF. So I'm not right. sure. Right. Uh, I don't know how to do it, honestly, in Mac. But I, I don't know either, but this is uh, better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least, yeah, I think so. Sorry, okay, so no I, I Excuse me, can you say something? Uh, Atocha, you can use it with the view in the bottom part of your screen. 
Acrobat Pro C DC file edit view. In view, you can change full screen mode. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, learned something. Okay. So, but still, I I will be uh, reading out, so uh, you don't miss anything, and I will. Uh, all right. So, diagnoses are constructed as I was saying with incomplete and dynamic information, and also there is neither a unique procedure nor a privileged model for the construction of uh, of diagnosis. So, uh, well, from philosophy of science, we uh, import all all of these. Um, but why uh, diagnoses are uncertain, among other things, because in medicine, there are no general laws. There are no universal laws. They are statistical laws and not many times applied to, to, to individuals. So I will make now, uh, I will start introducing you to the case that we will be dealing with formally. Usually, when a brain tumor is present, among the signs we could find, not always, we could find, there is progressive growth and compression of neighboring structures, which all together may lead to an increase in the intracranial pressure or cephalea. Cephalea is another name for a headache. So we don't have general laws. Usually something happens, and when that happens, it could be one or, 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 or another thing. Uh, and of course, we would like to see this in a, in a more logical way. So this means that we don't have like normal uh, 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 quantifiers. We have to use some kind of, uh, some other kind of uh, quantifiers. So only most patients with a brain tumor present an increase in the intracranial pressure and cephalia. And some patients, it, it, it so happens that some patients with a brain tumor present neither intracranial pressure nor cephalia. In fact, few patients with no brain tumor present present an increase in the intracranial pressure and cephalea. So when an MD is in front of a patient, of course, there are some medical laws, but he or she has to find out what is the particular situation of that person. Uh, moreover, there is no unique procedure, as I said. The construction of a diagnosis is a complex phenomenon. There is no unique procedure, much less a privileged one, for the construction of a medical diagnosis. And I, Anna, as I said, Several kinds of reasoning, as well as other cognitive tasks, are involved. Medical practice involves observation, reasoning, intuition, and experimentation. And all of that interact with each other. And I will concentrate only on the reasoning part, though accepting that uh, there, may, there may be many reasoning types interacting. At least these ones, analogy, induction, abduction, and deduction coexist. Uh, really what's uh, very relevant is this, uh, that this is the uh, paper that I uh, already showed you, well, the uh, first page. So now let's move to abduction. For some of you, maybe there are some of you who don't know uh, that abduction or, or, or the, uh, let's put it this way, the formulation of abduction was uh, given by Peirce. He founded the school of thought uh, known as pragmatism. And it says, the surprising fact, phi is observed, but if alpha were true, phi would, be a phi would be a matter of course. Hence, there is a reason to suspect that alpha is true. Let's not forget that besides this uh, formulation, Peirce also has uh, two additional criteria. One, uh, that alpha must be testable. We need to produce explanations that we can test. And moreover, he had a, a whole theory called the economics of research, which in this case, uh, it's interpreted as there may be many, many explanations uh, that we can uh, generate. And in a way we need those explanations that we can test and that are some people People may interpret this as simple as possible, but in any case, economy has to do with the issue of producing uh, many explanations. So normally in logic, uh, this uh, formulation has been inter interpreted in the following way. The first thing to note is that it's not really the, the fact that 
that phi is surprising is generally not captured. You see, it's all, it's phi, like you know, surprising. Then there is a second premise which may be interpreted, but not always as an implication. And one thing that uh, that always has to be very clear is that although it's a, a, an argument and it's an inferential relationship, the conclusion, how we assert the conclusion is not, uh, is not totally certain. We can only, uh, abductions only generate suspicions or things that have, have to be tested, conjectures. So this is uh, really important for uh, Peirce's uh, formulation. In this context, we can think in this context, which is medicine, we can think of this formulation as we have the effect that is the symptom or the sign. Then we have uh, from medical knowledge, a mechanism, a mechanism that I know that something implies phi. So I can assert uh, with some, uh, with the status of a hypothesis, that alpha, maybe alpha is true. So I am inferring the cause, a possible cause from an effect. And this, this is also why abduction is sometimes uh, labeled deduction in reverse or, ba or, or uh, backtracking. We go from the effect to the possible cause, okay? So, uh, but, what I did uh, from my thesis, and I have been uh, using, I have to say, this distinction, is that I distinguished, as I already said, there's no way in, the, in this uh, interpretation of abduction that captures that phi is surprising. The way I am interpreting that is that it's not explained. One issue with abduction is that it always happens with a background theory. Abductive reasoning is triggered by a surprising fact, Nothing is surprising, but with respect to a theory, to a background theory, a, a theta theory, and it's an explanation. So I distinguish two types, uh, which I call trigger types for abductive problem. In the literature of abduction, the notion of abductive problem is very well known. We are in face on, a, on an abductive problem when the fact to be explained does not follow from the theory theta, but neither the negation. It's a novelty in the sense that it's something new that for which we did not have an explanation so far, but it's, it doesn't contradict the theory. That is, it's not inconsistent with it. And most of the work, especially in computer science, is oriented to abductive novelty. And we can deal with an abductive interpretation with the form of the argument when we're here. But as uh, many people from philosophy of science know and from the history of science, many of the discoveries are actually not done by uh, finding novelties, but on the contrary by anomalies. Anomalies are facts or phi is an anomalous fact when the theory does not account for it, but it turns out that the theory accounts for its negation. Basically, what we have is that our theory predicts the contrary, the negation of what we are seeing or, or, or what we are regarding as a fact. And this is a very important uh, operation, if you want to call it operation. Sorry, I uh, need to move this because I don't see the... Okay, let me just put it this way. Uh, the thing with anomaly is that in order to solve or rather to incorporate a surprising fact, we actually have to go into a revision process. That is, first of all, especially of course, if we want to maintain consistency. That, what does that mean? This means that first of all, for an anomalous fact, I have to revise my theory. Theta has to be revised into theta prime so that I make uh, theta consistent with the fact to be explained. So it's another theory. And I have to contract those formulas that contradict with the, uh, with, with, with the anomalous fact. And once I have solved that, once I have the revised theory into theta prime, then I can use 
the same thing I used here to solve to solve my uh, problem. I think this will be more clear in the in the next uh, slide. So in abduction, we talk about abductive problems and abductive solutions. An abductive problem, especially uh, triggered by a novelty in my uh, terminology, uh, has this precondition. As I said, phi doesn't follow from theta and not phi doesn't follow for, from theta either. And alpha is a solution if adding it to theta, phi is derived after all. This uh, relationship can be a classical relationship, yes. However, in this case, I am using this just as a general symbol saying it doesn't have to be classical, it can be another thing. If it were classical, however, uh, most of you may have noticed that this is not enough because if I add to my theory, if I add whatever is inconsistent, then I will derive whichever. So in fact, abduction can be in classical logic interpreted as backward deduction plus additional conditions. And one of them at least is consistency. Uh, but what happens in the case of anomaly? In the case of anomaly, in terms of what I have to do, as I was saying in a previous uh, slide, is that I need first to contract my theta. I have to uh, subtract of all those formulas that generate inconsistencies. And only then I add uh, my uh, solution to the new uh, theta. And I'm, I am particularly interested in this uh, characterization or in this case when I have uh, a theory that predicts the contrary of the fact. And for that, an, an interpretation of abduction as an argument is not enough. I need something of the kind of belief revision. And that's why this is fully connected with the area of belief revision, as some of you may know, founded by Alchuron, uh, Garden Force, and uh, Mackinson. Okay, now I was able to see the whole screen, but I don't see any of you. So please uh, talk to me in case uh, somebody has something to uh, say. Okay, sorry. So given that, now I move to adaptive logics. Why I wanted adaptive logics? Well, in order to model, as I said, uh, uh, a context like the one I presented in uh, medical reasoning or medical diagnosis, we need some kind of logic which uh, can model ampliative reasoning. Peirce, Charles Peirce called ampliative reasoning all that inferences that amplifies knowledge. That's why it's called amp amplitude. But the problem is that amplifying knowledge makes your logic uh, or rather your inferences uh, re retractable. We need conclusions derived at a certain point that could be withdrawn later with additional information. Maybe we don't need uh, the uh, uh, giving conclusions anymore. But still that same conclusion can be reconsidered later in the proof. And something I like very much of adaptive logics is that they can combine both deductive and abductive steps, steps sorry, in the same proof. In fact, as I write here, adaptive logics model dynamic reasoning processes with incomplete information, just what we need in order to model medical reasoning. I'm not saying I'm going to model medical reasoning in full, of course, but it uh, helps a lot to. Uh, model parts of it. Why they are called adaptive logics, as I already said, but maybe not all people were present. They were divided by, uh, invented by Diederik Battens in Belgium in the 90s or the 80s. I uh, don't remember very well. And he has there like a whole school. The thing is that technically they are, they are rather complicated. So I think this is why not many people use adaptive logics, but they are uh, like perfect to model these kind of changes. And also, as you will see from a logical point of view, they are, um, uh, I don't know if in English is, this word is used, but they are very clean because they actually function like logic. They are completed theorems and all uh, uh, things that logicians like. 
But in any case, adaptive logics are called as such because this means that an adaptive logic adapts itself to the set of premises to which it is applied. That is to say, the premises determine which inferences are correct. The aim of these logics is to interpret the premise set as normally as possible, according to a specific standard of normality. When Dietrich Battens invented these logics, he was actually thinking on paraconsistent logics, in which you interpret your, you want to have your premises as consistent as possible. But sometimes an inconsistency comes in and somehow you have to tolerate it, not produce more, but tolerate it. And afterwards, one of, of, of uh, his uh, pupils, a uh, close colleague of my, mine, uh, Joachim Haus, she invented the logic for abduction, but only for novelty abduction. So I use that. Let me show you just like an example, a rule that it's called a conditional rule. Well, um, the thing here is, let's think of uh, any kind of logic with a proof theory. And uh, what we can see, at least visually, is that an additional column is put to adaptive logic. So besides the uh, line number, the formula that we want to have and the status of the formula, if it's a premise or if it's a consequence of which uh, rule applied to which steps, there's an additional column. And these are the conditions under which we are asserting a formula. Premises need no conditions, see? So we have this formula for all x, if p the x, then q, the q of x. Then we have another premise, which doesn't need any conditional rule. But now let's think of abduction. Remember that the rule or the inference abduction is when you have the effect you are going to abduce or to infer the cause or the consequence and the, the antecedent. So if we want to assert P of A and not have a fallacy, we have to assert it with a rule that's called conditional rule example, real, rule conditional over one and two. And here it says, this is the, the set of abnormality with respect to this formula. This means I can assert P of A, no problem, unless I have previously the situation in which I have this formula for all X, P of X implies Q of X, that is number one, number two, and the negation of this one. So I don't run into inconsistency. So this uh, formula, this line is going to live or is going to be there until this situation is not there, okay? And let me just show you, I'm not going to go into details, but of course, if, if my audience is uh, made of logicians, I thought it was important for you to at least have a little bit of taste of what this logic is. First of all, our logic, the adaptive logic is characterized always by a lower limit logic. Many times this is classical logic, any logic with static proofs, then the set of abnormalities, which I already introduced. And this is a set of well formula, form formula characterized by a logical schema. So if we want a logic that deals with inconsistencies, we have the set uh, our set of abnormalities is this. These are the abnormal abnormalities that we have to chase. So some formulas are going to be asserted until I find something like this. And for abduction, you already saw this other one. And for, ab for anomaly abduction, we need both of them because remember, we have to be revising our theory. So, and there's also an adaptive strategy. Uh, they call it a strategy because it has a, a procedural taste, meaning there is a, a strategy to mark uh, lines. What do I mean to mark marking lines? Marking lines is if I have this line and later I find that I can infer not P of A by any other rule which is not conditional, any unconditional rule, I have to retract this. In fact, in adaptive logic, you don't retract, you mark. Then you say, hey, this one cannot go on anymore. So the adaptive strategy really has to do with the marking strategy. 
uh, and they have uh, uh, proposed two marketing strategies. We will be using the reliability one, but I'm not gonna go into those details. And besides that format, it has three inference rules. The first one is a premise, which as I said, uh, premise can be inferred, it's already there. There is no uh, condition. Also, I have unconditional rules. Remember that I have a lower limit logic. If my lower limit logic is classical, then I have proofs precisely in the same way in which I, uh, in which I have my uh, de derivations here. Uh, however, if this, uh, any of these uh, formula steps were asserted by uh, some unconditional rule, then I have to keep track of the ab abnormalities. And I keep track of the abnormalities. And in the end, the disjunction of those abnormalities, which is called the DAB uh, formula, it's going to be there. And then I have, as I uh, show you an example, the conditional rule. This only means that I have a derivation in a logic I already know, like classical logic, for example. I can infer B uh, disjointed or with a disjunction of the abnormal formulas. So going back to the idea of anomaly trigger abduction, if I have a solution, I just remind you, if I have a, an abductive problem triggered by an anomaly, the solution is going to be the set theta prime, which is the revised formula with alpha is a solution for the anomaly. The solution doesn't have only uh, alpha. It needs to have the whole theory because we are revising the original theta. It's a solution for an abductive problem, which is the original theta with, with um, phi f, I get this uh, theta prime subtracting all those formula. And I uh, uh, later, as I already told you, I think, generate uh, this inference. Theta together with a proposed explanation um, can be what supports phi or derives phi. And our logic, what we propose in that paper, it's called lata r or lata r. And is based, as I said already, on two adaptive logics, clun R. This is one very well known in the adaptive logic uh, community, which is uh, serves to uh, deal with inconsistencies. And this is the one uh, designed by uh, Joachim House for abduction in order to interpret the theory as consistent as possible while searching for an explanation for an anomalous fact. Uh, you may have the question, I hope you have it, I will uh, tell you in a bit why, how is that I deal with this subtraction? Because at some point I will have to uh, subtract things and that is not very clear how to do it within a uh, format of a uh, proof, a, what we call it a dynamic proof. So our lata R has as a lower li limit logic this clone R, set of abnormalities, two sets of abnormalities, one for inconsistencies, the other one for, um, for abductions. Uh, it needs to have this uh, other restriction, but I won't go into that detail. And it, the way of marking uh, will be with, with reliability. And one, once we have obtained a LATA R proof, we perform an abductive procedure on it. Why? Because when I find a contradiction, I actually need to retract, to backtrack for contraction. So we invented a procedure called retro and it's executed on the dynamic proof in order to eliminate those formula causing conflict with the fact we explained. I will go into an example. Don't I don't think you will understand just by saying this. And Retro identifies the inconsistencies and then deletes from the theory some of the formula involved in the generation of such inconsistencies. In the end, yes, it deletes them from the theory, but in the end, it deletes them or marks them within the proof. And then we generate the explanations. So you see there are 
the, the two operations for people who know belief revisions, the two operations are here. First, one to contract the theory and another one to generate the explanations on the contracted theory. As any formula obtained by the RC rule is a good candidate to be an abductive explanation. This procedure inspects the proof and considers all the applications of such a rule. Okay, so now let me uh, go again to my example. Uh, as I said, I will treat this uh, very briefly. So let's think of this predicate, P of XY means person X has a tumor in organ Y. Uh, CE of X means somebody, uh, a person X has cephalea, headache. I of uh, X means X presents an increase in intracranial pressure. And we have two constants to uh, represent the particular patient being treated and be a constant for representing the brain. In fact, what I am uh, representing here is precisely what it says here. When there is a tumor, then there is an increase in the intracranial pressure and cephalea. This is part, so to speak, of our medical knowledge. And I assert this formula as a premise. For all X, if X has a brain tumor, then it has cephalea and the, uh, there is an increase in intracranial pressure. Moreover, sorry for the movements, uh, but I am not changing, I am only adding things. It's just that it moves <laughs> up and down. Then I uh, assume, and this is uh, what, I, uh, what I said at the very beginning, my interest is to see how medical doctors, because they do this all the time, prove or test their hypothesis. This medical doctor thinks that this person may have, this person A may have a brain tumor, okay? So this is asserted, this one is asserted with the status of a premise. And the third one is the observation. As it turns out, uh, well, I, uh, I think all of them may be called premises. This one is part of medical knowledge. This one is hypothetical. And this one only means that it's a premise, but is the empirical premise, so to speak. And it says that the, this particular per patient, as it turns out, it doesn't have cephalea and doesn't have intracranial pressure. And so uh, what happens? I don't even need uh, adaptive logics for this. It happens that by an unconditional rule of one and two, I can deduct four, uh, which means what? It means that I have an inconsistency here. So three and four are the negation of each other. And this was also produced by rule unconditional. So. First of all, sorry, neurological case, yes. Now our procedure retro has to, uh, has to start working. I uh, make a small pause here just to say that um, it's important for you to know that this is not what an adaptive logician would do. When we first presented this, uh, this problem in Belgium, Hopefully, we already had uh, published our paper because uh, adaptive logicians didn't like this. They said, why do you use a procedure? This is not adaptive logics. This is very strange. But as I will say at the end, I think there's a way of thinking of logic as not just an inferential process, not just inferential rules, but also procedures. How is this done here? So I know that this is a line on which I have to apply my retro procedure because it's an inconsistency. So first of all, with my retro procedure, I have to see where it comes from. Of course, it, this is very simple. It comes from three and four. And where do in, in, uh, in turn come three and four from? Uh, I have uh, first, let me check this one. And what I see is that this one comes from one and two. So here comes the first part of, uh, well, first is the identification of which part of the proof 
I am going to think of it of deleted, in fact, we mark. And here, as some people know from uh, belief revision theories, the contraction operation also needs a way of telling which uh, premises or which formulas are going to be retracted. And that's not a logical thing. That's why people like Garden Force has this notion of entrenchment. You want to retract those formulas that are least entrenched. This, uh, for philosophers of science, goes to this idea of, uh, of, of, of Lakatos, of having all theories have a protective belt. And here, what we have in our uh, retro procedure is that we already know that one is a premise and, and the other one is a hypothesis. And this one is more important than this other one. This was just a hypothesis and it's really telling the medical doctor that this one has to go out. This guy doesn't have a, uh, a tumor in the brain because uh, if, if I uh, put that into my theory, I go into a, a contradiction. So I decide that I'm going to mark this one, you see? And sorry, my uh, uh, set of abnormalities is precisely uh, this one, and that's why I take it out. So taking it out means that now I only have what it was a premises, the premise, and I had to uh, take out that, uh, that hypothesis. As I told one of you at the beginning, I have the continuation of this proof, but after the presentation, because I never, I never have time to present that. But in case somebody... sorry, Atocha, do you do you mind if I, Atocha, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, can you can you do one one slide back? Of course, of course. Another one, this yes, one? here. So I I'm I am maybe. Uh, I'm familiar with with adaptive logic, so obviously my remark here might be in the line of in the line of of an adaptive logician looking at this. Um, but I I do see I do this, I do see how this mimics uh, a contraction from AGM. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really don't see the adaptive part of this, right? Because the, there is there is no derivation under condition for which you're doing the marking. Now, unless this is coming afterwards, which you might say, no, this is coming up later. But unless I see that, I don't see why this qualifies as an adaptive logic. I, I understand that this qualifies as a proof, uh, a, a proof derivation mimicking under certain interpretation, mimicking a contraction of AGM, uh, as in AGM, uh, but I really don't see the, the marking part of this. Well, okay, so uh, I think your, your comment, and I'm uh, glad to hear it again, <laughs> is uh, related to uh, the, I am going away for good and for bad perhaps, but I'm going away from adaptive logics with my retro procedure, you see? So here I'm going away at least in two respects. First of all, to assert something with, uh, with, with, with different status. That's the first thing. And the other thing is that, and I hope this serves as an answer to you, I'm not really marking, you see? In fact, I am deleting this one. Right, right. So, but, but, mm -hmm. then, but then why, and, and I appreciate both things. I mean, I like the mm -hmm. distinction between a premise and an hypothesis. I, I, I find pretty natural the removal of certain certain conditions or certain certain mm -hmm. content under under a certain interpretation but i really don't see why then you need the adaptive part of it okay well uh, uh sorry yes here basically i i went back until here because uh, perhaps this is not after all a very good example because here all the conditions I, are empty i'm not exactly i'm not yeah. really using the extra part of adaptive logics so what you're saying is there could be there could be places where you where your conditions are not empty exactly okay. but, but then, then let then... me maybe for people like you sorry who are not uh what time it is uh I'm sorry, I will not go into much detail anyhow. That's fine. But yeah, but here, if I continue with the things uh, I have here, uh, an, an unconditional one, but then I can see better 
how it really works with, with, with adaptive logic. Because up to here, the, the only thing I did, and I'm very glad that you spotted uh, uh, that so quickly, the only thing I'm doing, sorry for the going back and going back, the only thing I'm doing here, you see, it's the backtrack for contraction. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and as I said already, uh, this, I don't really need adaptive logics for this. I would need the adaptive logic when I go back to the second part. And when I go, uh, no back, sorry. When I go to the second part, once I have my theta prime done, once I have my contracted theory and no uh, inconsistencies, then I have to generate an explanation. Okay, in this case, this person doesn't ha have a brain tumor, but uh, what is the problem with the symptoms and the signs that has, although it doesn't have this problem? And uh, I'm sure I'm not answering you the precise question, but in this case, the medical doctors had to uh, come up with some other explanations and they eventually found a tumor elsewhere. But in the, in, in, in the very struct that I show you, I'm not really showing you this part, okay? Yeah, so yeah, that's fine. Your, okay. your, your, uh, your observation, thank you. Yes, it was uh, uh, very good. Okay, so uh, that's why in this kind of talks, you don't go into the logical details, but I also wanted to, uh, to get to this final part, uh, which I think is of interest. Uh, to anybody. So what is logic? So people will say, well, maybe this is or not interesting, but this is not logic because you are using a procedure, although uh, you already told me that, well, you welcome belief revision, but the adaptive logics here was not uh, very clear. But well, for, for some of you who know in, in philosophy of science the demarcation problem, I think we have also the demarcation problem, so to speak, in logic, meaning to what extent, where we can draw the line, this is logic and this are, is not logic, or this is a logical system versus this is maybe a, a nice formalization, but it's not logic. Uh, some people rather like to speak as, uh, rather than logic, you know, like uh, Dov Gavai, he prefers to talk about uh, logical systems. However, uh, if we go back, even uh, uh, people like Neil, I don't know who Neil, because it, it, it was the uh, husband and the wife who wrote this uh, book on logic, Neil, the Neil and Neil, and they would say that a formal system is logical if and only if it's complete. And so, well, this is nice, but then many formal systems that we would like to call logical are not logical. And in fact, uh, people like Domet uh, thought a lot formal system is logical if and only if it characterizes precise notions. And this was, if I know well, taken by Quine uh, when he said that, well, model logic, uh, it was not real logic because he tried to formalize something that is really epistemic and that's not very clear. Uh, and they also, uh, with this, characterization would take out uh, systems like second order logic and so on. Uh, then we go beyond, so to speak, orthodoxy. I'm sure uh, in, in, in this room, virtual room, there's nobody who would think as the uh, orthodox logicians. However, what is, we still have this demarcation problem. And then let's see what people like Susan Hack says. She says a formal system is logical if it has an interpretation according to canons of valid argumentation. I like very much this other characterization of uh, Joachim House, uh, who says that logic is any formal system that allows in a, in a specific context of application to distinguish good and bad reasoning. In addition, any formal system should be characterized in a formal and decent way by a semantics and a proof theory. So I like very much this characterization because it's not counting anything as uh, logical. However, she is uh, asking for semantics and proof theory. 
you know that at least in AI, some logics do have a proof theory, but don't have semantics. In fact, Diederik and uh, uh, Diederik Battens and uh, Joachim Haus work a lot in giving the semantics to adaptive logics. I have to say, I don't understand that semantics. This is really very complicated, but it exists. Uh, for me, I would be very happy to have a logic if it has a semantics or a proof theory. Uh, but on top of everything, I like the interpretation of Donald Gillis and more in particular, that of Kowalski, the inventor of uh, logic programming, which is logic is inference plus control. It's not just the inferential part, but you have also a uh, more procedural, uh, sometimes you have procedural aspect in which you can uh, control what you are inferring. And I think adaptive logics are a, a good uh, thing for, for this. So I, uh, I don't know how, but I, I made it <laughs> at least in terms of time. <laughs>